So what I want to talk to you today is about how we evolve networks, how do we scale networks and how do we converge them to live in the world, the application world that we see today. So first thing, for those of you who don't know Sienna, so who are we, what do we do? So people may, who do know us, maybe think of us in this left-hand box. You know, we build scalable, resilient packet optical transport networks. We are the road system of the telecoms world. We connect up 4G base stations. We connect up your DSL at home. We connect up data centers. That's what we do with good high bandwidth and very resilient. In terms of who we supply to around the world, well, in Poland, people like Orange, GTS, a number of enterprises, local government, universities. In the wider domain, British Telecom, Vimplecom in Russia, Mobile, Middle East, AT&T, Verizon, etc. You get the idea. Uh, we're currently number one, according to the analyst Deloro, in the packet optical transport space as of end of 2013, which we're quite proud of. So if you like, that's the left-hand column, which is great. But if you build nice, new, converged networks, you certainly need to make money on them. And that's what this middle column is really thinking about. How do we help you launch new transport-based services on your transport network? And many people today think transport is just to transport my other services. Ethernet and optical services are the fastest growing segment in the world today in connectivity. And that's driven by all the stuff, you know, all the bandwidth growth, 4G LTE, DSL going up, GPON. It's driven by cloud networking, IT outsourcing. All of these guys need higher bandwidth reliable circuits, which is pushing them towards Ethernet and optical. And on the right-hand side, thinking about what the future holds. So at many events I attend today, SDN, Software Defined Networking, is a very hot topic. So I'll touch a little bit about what that edgy means from a transport network perspective, and I'll give you some practical examples about how we can enable the transport network to be programmable using software. OK, so let's get to the real content. So today, we believe it's an app-centric world. And I don't care what you're doing. I mean, most of us have smartphones in the room. We're using all sorts of applications. I continually watch catch-up TV. It's rare that I watch ordinary TV these days. If I'm an enterprise, I may be hosting my IT services using Amazon EC2 Cloud. Perhaps they're hosted in a telecity data center. So all of these things are being driven by applications. So what does that mean to a networking perspective? And this is something we've been thinking about long and hard for probably the last one to two years. Inside a data center, I need computing platforms, x86 platforms, to run all my IT applications. I need big storage arrays to store all my data. And again, using my analogy, who, who in the room's got an iPhone? <coughs> oh, only a few. So iCloud, what is iCloud? It's a piece of storage equipment in a data center somewhere belonging to Apple. Does any of us actually know where Apple's nearest data center is? I don't. Do we care? Not really, until we can't connect to it. And that's why this bottom part is so important, the connect piece. If all your data and your mission-critical IT applications are sitting in a remote data center, you better be sure you can connect to them and connect to them reliably 24-7, 365 days a year. So it's really important that we align these three things of compute, storage, and connect. And what we're really trying to do is make this transformation possible from a networking perspective to satisfy these applications that are running over it. And you'll see as we go forward with SDN as well, is even making that linkage closer again. OK, let's look at a little more detail. So first one is traditional domains. I would suspect almost every service provider in the world today has what they would call an access domain, a metro domain, regional core domains. And guess what? Historically, those are separate boxes. So you know, if I look back 10 years, in the metro, we had SDH E1s. Then we got to regional and core, and we didn't have E1s anymore. We only had STM1 granularity, and those were different boxes, different cross-connects. The world has moved on, but the premise is still the same. We still build networks like this. And the problem with building networks like this is you have lots of interfaces. 
You've interfaces at the customer, interfaces between each domain, adding cost and lowering performance, things like latency in the circuit. Now, in the world of data centers and applications, where do data centers actually sit? We heard from TeleCity today who are building some right in the center of towns, but with some limitations on things like power and space. If you look, um, Google built a big data center in the forests of Sweden. Why? Because it was near a power station and air conditioning was pretty cheap. If you look across the US today, guys like Equinix who own huge data centers are building them all right beside power stations. Not beside cities, not beside transport networks, beside power stations. So they're not obeying this metro, regional, long haul thing. They're building where they need to build to satisfy their business. Therefore, we have to connect to them. So this is what we have to start thinking about. These data centers are getting big. They don't obey our normal rules. Therefore, we need to provide this connectivity. So how do we do that? So first of all, you can start using coherent optics, which can go any distance across any boundary. Very, very simple. And these things didn't exist 10 years ago. Then at that boundary in your network, you can start using what we call RODEMs, remote optical add drop multiplexers, things that switch light. So you don't need to use electrical interfaces. You don't need to add cost. Let me give you a very simple example. Virgin Media in the UK did a press announcement about nine months ago. And they were connecting up uh, data centers, I guess a competitor of TeleCities, actually Red Station, who have multiple data centers in the UK. And they gave them 10 gigabit wavelengths. Now, how they did that was they put a small optical box with coherent optics, connected it straight into their core network. Now, is that a core network with a metro tail? Is it an extension of your core network? Who cares? What they were actually doing was giving the customer what they needed. Connection straight between their data centers across boundaries at the highest latency performance and at the lowest cost because they didn't have these back-to-back -back electronics in there. So that's what they were doing. So we need to start thinking about this differently. And what we're really trying to get across here is, you know, this is what we're trying to design networks to do. Connect users to content and connect those content centers together. So we need to start thinking like this and optimizing the network and converging the network to look like this. Okay, next piece of the puzzle. Um, don't know about you guys, but I'm no good at predicting the future. So the same happens in telecoms. So Ethernet services or optical services? Well, I'll sell Ethernet leased line services to my enterprises. I'd probably sell optical wholesale services to other carriers. If I go into data centers, I'll maybe supply some Ethernet circuits for LAN extension or fiber channel over Ethernet. But I also need to do things like native fiber channel between data centers over an optical circuit. Media and broadcast is growing today. They need native video transport over optical. So how much Ethernet? How much optical? Don't know. So the simple way around that is to build yourself a forecast tolerant architecture. So have interfaces that will handle both. Keep it simple and aggregate the services together on the same optical infrastructure. So maximize the efficiency, but don't force yourself to predict the future because I don't know anyone who's good at it. Otherwise, we would probably just win the national lottery and retire. Second part of this is scaling. So bandwidth, everyone knows bandwidth is growing dramatically. And everybody knows nobody's really paying for it. Revenue stays similar or maybe growing a little bit. Bandwidth's growing this much. So what that really means is I need to scale my optical infrastructure hugely without ripping it out and starting again. So my existing fiber my existing amplifiers, my existing boxes, I want to move from 10 gigabit wavelengths to 40 to 100, 200, 400, 800 terabit, all in the same infrastructure. And I must be able to do that simply. A couple of little examples, um, BT and Comcast. So with British Telecom, what we did was took their existing Sienna network actually a really, really bad quality fiber link between London and their headquarters in West England. 450 kilometers really per performance fiber. They were running 10 gigabit coherent today. We put alongside that wavelengths 40, 100, 200, 400, 800 wavelengths and did full testing over about a week to prove they could do it. Now, BT are running 100 gig in their network today, 
They're not yet ready for 200, 400, 800, but they want it to know when I need the capacity, can I do it on my existing network? Because that is a huge cost difference. And they proved they could. Comcast did the same. They did it later than BT, and of course they wanted to do it slightly bigger, so they did a terabit wavelengths. But the same concept on their existing network alongside live services to prove they could. So these guys are ready to go, but it means you're ready to upgrade your network when you need to because of capacity, which is really important for thinking about the future. So again, this is really about building a scalable, forecast-tolerant, converged infrastructure. Next piece of the puzzle. So transport networks, by definition, have to be very, very reliable and robust. Everybody gets fiber breaks in their network. Someone's out there with a big digger digging up roads, and they guess what? They dig up your fiber. And it happens quite regularly. So you have a couple of options here. You can use a layer zero control plane at the wavelength level that will reroute everything on that fiber to a different route. If it gets broken, it'll reroute it. So it's not really intelligent, it just finds another path, and it doesn't do it that quickly, but it will protect your whole fiber. Okay? Alternative is to do it at layer one, which is basically sub-wavelength. So you put multiple OTN services inside a wavelength, for example, gigabit Ethernet or 2.5 gig SDH. You can put them all together inside a 10 gigabit pipe. So with using a layer one control plane, you start having more flexibility. If your wavelength isn't full, you can aggregate multiple services onto that wavelength to make it more efficient. I can do fast protection switching, 50 millisecond, and I can use the control plane to protect multiple times. And interesting, looking at the top part of this diagram, the service levels, um, AT&T in the US, have probably the biggest uh, layer one control plane in the world. It's over 800 nodes. Their website actually talks about four levels of restoration. And their top level of restoration will survive three fiber breaks. So they've structured the protection to say, I can survive three times. Next level down, two times, and so on. You get the picture. So the question is, okay, I can do this at, at the fiber level or at layer one, sub-wavelength. Which two options, what should I do? I would love to tell you there's one answer. There's not. The right answer is the right mix. And again, it's all about efficiency. So if I have full wavelengths and I don't need high performance 50 millisecond switching, it's cheaper to do it using a layer zero control plane. If I want to offer differentiated OTN services with 50 millisecond protection and three levels of restoration, I need my layer one control plane. So it's really about getting the right mix of this, the lowest cost and the highest performance. And you can absolutely differentiate on services using the layer one control plane. Interesting, the first guys to deploy this were the submarine guys. Why? Because it can take you anything up to six months to repair a fiber break onto the sea. Um, an example again of this one, uh, Verizon did a press release two years ago now after the Japanese tsunami. And it was a very carefully worded press release because there was huge loss of life. But their press release basically said because they were running OTN mesh restoration, their network was still up. Six fiber cables got broken with that tsunami. The Verizon network was still up. And they phrased it that it was helping emergency services coordinate aid relief, et cetera, et cetera. But people like NTT in Japan lost their network because they didn't have resiliency. Now, yes, were some of these circuits running slower because suddenly a circuit that was going across the Atlantic now had to grow across the Pacific Ocean, but it still got there. So you can do multiple levels of switching. So again, you can differentiate here. So it's getting the right mix of, uh, of cost and service. Okay, moving forward, intelligence, SDN. So first thing about SDN is how open is it? So Sienna firmly believes it needs to be open both northbound and southbound. And some of our competitors only believe it should be northbound. So please do ask that question because we feel it's very important. So northbound, if you like the bit in the middle, is the network control software. Today that's network management systems. Tomorrow it will be more clever versions of that, but that's where the, the ability to control the network sits. 
Above that, you have other applications. So things like VMware software inside a data center doing data center load balancing virtualization. Imagine if it could signal direct to the network to ask for bandwidth as it needs it. So that's the sort of thing you can do at the top level. At the bottom level, you have the, if you like, the control layer talking to the actual physical network. So we firmly believe that should be open as well because that will allow you flexibility to decide exactly how you want to run your network and how you want to write applications. So simple examples. So operator one, existing Sienna customer uses Sienna control software. Great. We're happy with that. Operator number two says, well, you know, I like some of your software, Sienna, but there's some things I'd like to do myself. Okay? So combine them. That's okay. Operator three, an example of this would be someone like Google. Lots of good software engineers and a lot of money will just go, I'll do it myself. Okay? That's okay too. And to allow that to happen, you absolutely must be writing this code on open source. So we're part of a uh, consortium called Open Daylight, which is exactly about writing that in an open framework with open source code to allow you to have this flexibility. And you know, the other thing, many operators I talk to, one of the key things they want from being able to write their own apps is multi-vendor. Can I control multiple vendors in my network with exactly the same application? With this scenario, yes, you can. So it absolutely gives you the flexibility you need. So let me give you a real example. Bandwidth on demand. So I talked earlier about linking, connect, compute, and storage. I uh, met a French customer a couple of weeks ago talking to their product manager, product director, actually, who ran all of their product stuff. And I started talking to him about this. He went, stop. I get it. He says, you can go onto their website today, get on-demand compute and on-demand storage. You can buy it on a daily basis, weekly basis, gigabits of storage. You then go onto a different page on their website, and the only way to connect to their data center for on-demand services is to buy an annual contract. So I'm offering on-demand services here, but the only way to get to it is to buy a year-long contract. That makes no sense. So start aligning the on-demand. So we start with an SDN controller. We write an application called V1, Virtual Wide Area Network. And we have two ways of accessing that. Left-hand side is a client portal. So I log into a port on the internet, and I specify what I want. Right-hand side is automatic signaling. If you like true SDN, where the end application talks through this application to the network through V1. So what might I be able to do? So a simple example here is time of day scheduling. So on average, I want 100 megabit of service as an enterprise to the data center. But once a week, I do my backup. And I want one gigabit once a week for one hour once a week. My only choice today is to buy a one gigabit circuit. So would I like to be able to buy an average 100 megabit and an extra one gigabit once a week, guaranteed performance one gigabit. Of course I would. That's what I actually need. So the question is, how do you as a service provider price this? So you do have options of adding a pricing engine. So at peak times, I price it more expensive. Middle of the night, I price it cheaper. Entice your customers to load balance on your network. Airlines have been doing this for years. I fly with EasyJet quite a lot, low-cost UK airline. You book early, you get it cheap. You book late, high price. Airlines have been doing this for many, many years. And ultimately then, you get the bandwidth you want it, and it gets provisioned. Enterprise A was provisioned through the portal. Enterprise B directly through the API. So how do you make money doing this? So let's take my example, 100 megabit on average, 1 gigabit bursting for one hour per week. So today that guy has to buy the one gigabit circuit on an annual contract. Let's say it is $1,000 a month. So you go back to him and you say, I can give you exactly what you want, average 100 megabit, one hour per week, one gigabit, for $500. Are you interested? Of course they're interested, half price. You then sell that same one gigabit circuit to multiple enterprises. 
Enterprise 1, 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Enterprise 2, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Enterprise 3, 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. At $500 each, after your first two hours, you break even. R3, 4, 5, pure margin. Enterprise is happy. They're getting it. What they want, cheaper. You get more customers on your same sized network with more margin. Make sense? So this is what we see of the world going forward. And it aligns with the storage and uh, connect and compute methodology we talked about. So just to summarize, so what we're trying to do is make transformation possible in a converged network. We need to break down regional boundaries. They don't exist anymore in this new world. We need to allow ourselves to be forecast tolerant, whether it's the type of service or the scalability. And we need to be programmable going forward to allow you to scale in future with new value-added revenue-generating applications. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Two minutes, if anyone's got any questions. Questions have to be in English, sorry. <laughs> no? Okay, we're good. Okay, so thank you for your very visual presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.